Hey guys, Sunday morning vlog. We're gonna nerd it up big time. All right, somebody asked a question on the YouTubes. They asked whether or not I could define the basics of programming, or as I like to call them, the core concepts. Now, I jotted down a few notes on my giant pad. Let me start off by saying that this is a look at all these concepts from uh, overhead view, like a flyover. I'm not going to get into too many details. And as you listen to this stuff and you're a beginner or you're just learning, don't freak out. Don't go, oh man, I got to learn all this stuff. It's unbelievable. A lot of this stuff you got to learn over time. And the whole point of a good course, a good course does two things. Number one, it simplifies all these concepts and techniques. And number two, it identifies the key components in the right order so that you can get up and running as quickly as possible as a coder, as a developer. That's what a good course does. Ultimately, these foundational concepts, these basic concepts, and I'm not covering totally everything because some of the foundational concepts will depend on the type of coding that you're going to do, the type of programming that you're going to do. But this is going to give you a pretty good overview of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about foundational concepts. So let's start with number one. You look at language types. Now, you have different computer languages. You have markup languages. The most the big one is HTML5, of course. You have styling languages, CSS. That's the only one I'm aware of. And then you have full-fledged programming languages. There's differences between these types of languages. They each have their purposes. Now, a programming language is a language that actually provides functionality, actually does something. It provides the brains, if you will, of an app that you create. And programming languages could be JavaScript, could be Java, C++, C, Python, PHP, Ruby, Swift, and many, many others, Go, etc. And what you find is that different programming languages will have different specializations, they have different purposes. So let's go into that. In programming languages, you can have compiled languages versus interpreted. There's many pros and cons, by the way. What you're going to see when you're going through these foundational concepts, you have to understand uh, not one particular language, not one particular framework, if you will, not one particular approach is uh, universally best. It really depends on the type of work that you're doing. But it's good to understand these basic concepts so you can make proper decisions based on the type, A, the type of work that you want to do, and B, the type of project you're working on so you can come to that project with the right language, with the right approach, with the right thinking. So, yeah, so you've got compiled languages versus interpreted. Uh, you look at runtime speed versus writing speed. So, for example, let's, I'll explore that little concept, runtime versus writing time or write time. Runtime is basically the speed of the language as it runs, when it runs. So let's say you're writing an app, a program in C++. It writes really slow, meaning because it's a highly, uh, the type of language that it is, C++ requires that you spend a lot more time writing it versus other languages like a Python, for instance, where it's much quicker to write, and uh, but the trade-off is that Python runs much slower than C++. So there's runtime versus write time, and depending on the type of work that you need to do, you might choose a language like C++ or even assembly, which is super fast at runtime, but uh, very slow at write time. In many situations, in most situations these days, you're going to choose a language that is faster to write with, but maybe a little slower at runtime. So again, these are just basic concepts. I don't expect you to learn all this. It's just a Sunday morning vlog. I'm having my coffee. I'm just going over basic concepts here. I just want to give you an overview. In terms of language types, you can get into things compiled versus inter interpreted, strongly typed versus loosely typed. I'll get into that a little later. Uh, then you can get into things like type type conversion versus coercion, et cetera. This is all related to uh, data types, which is a part of the fundamental language constructs. These are universal constructs across programming languages. So what are these language constructs? You look at functions, variables, arrays, memory management, objects, loops, conditional, data types. Then you get into things like OOP versus procedural programming, 
You can get into uh, into an OOP itself, object-oriented program. Procedural versus OOP, by the way, if you're a total beginner, it's just a style of programming. We'll just leave it at that. Um, within OOP, there's these things, these basic concepts that you have to understand. Inheritance, uh, composition, interfaces, objects versus classes. And then there are uh, considerations in terms of how you would use an OOP style language in terms of something called code reuse. Again, code reuse is one of the basic concepts in programming. You want to reuse as much code as possible because A, it saves you time and saves errors. So there's different approaches to doing that. In object-oriented programming, you have something called inheritance, which is one way, which I say use very sparingly. And then another way is to use something called composition and interfaces. That's the way I prefer. And this comes to another basic concept, tight versus loose coupling of your objects or of your code base. One of the basic concepts in programming is that you want to write chunks of code in object-oriented programming that would be your objects. Again, this may be total nerd gibberish to you. Just try to take away the basic concepts when you're listening to me here. So when you got loose coupling versus tight coupling in your code, uh, essentially, our goal is as programmer is to as programmers is to keep our code very loosely coupled, meaning having our chunks of code, having them able to operate independently of each other. So you have a chunk of code here, and you have a chunk of code here, and they communicate, but they're not dependent on each other. They, they so you can move them around, and it just gives you a lot more flexibility in terms of when you're writing your apps. So again, these are basic concepts that. As you become more experienced, as you become an experienced developer, you, you keep this in mind so it helps you in terms of this, the decision making as you're developing your apps in terms of what's the better approach based on these concepts, right? Uh, yeah, so let's pull out of the languages now and then there's this infrastructure around the languages. Now, a lot of times these days, a lot of people are doing web-based coding because everything's communicating over the web. So you have to understand basic concepts like client versus server. Server-side programming versus client-side programming is very much related. Then you can get into uh, the basic uh, mechanisms of the internet, of the web. So something called HTTP, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. There's FTP, File Transfer Protocol. And there's other or protocols, just a, a method of transferring well, information over a network. The biggest network in the world, of course, is the internet. So you have different protocols. There's different reasons why you would use it, and, and there's you know there's 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 things to learn about that it can affect the way you write your app. One basic concept about the web is that it's a stateless it's it's a stateless um, paradigm, if you will. Uh, again, I'm going down the nerd rabbit hole here. My apologies, but this 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 is one of the key concepts that the web is stateless. And as such, you have to design your apps in a very particular way. This used to screw people up in the 90s when the web first came about. Traditional coders who did C++ or VB coding, who did something called uh, client-side uh, programming, they, uh, they had a difficult time dealing with the stateless nature of the web and how apps had to be constructed, had to be built based on that reality. Anyway, this a lot of these Several of these concepts, a lot of these concepts I, int I introduce actually in my courses. Now, my courses, I, I have one called Beginner's HTML, Beginner's JavaScript, Beginner's uh, CSS, Beginner's PHP. I'm renaming them with the release of Studio Web 4 because uh, they, they misrepresent what they're about. They should be, instead of calling it Beginner's HTML 5, it should be from beginner to pro, you know, because I cover the basics, but I get into things like HTTP. Uh, client server request response model in an HTML course, and there's reasons for that, and I get into all that. Anyway, same thing with the JavaScript and the PHP, so on. From these foundational concepts, you build up into other, found a little higher up, a little bit more advanced, and you got something called design patterns, programmatic design patterns. These are ways of organizing your code, ways of structuring your code, and Design patterns allows programmers to communicate each other, communicate with each other, 
in terms of how they feel certain aspects of an app, of a, pro, of a program, how it should be designed. And the biggest ones out there, well, the biggest one is called MVC, Model View Controller. You see most, well, just, well, just about most web apps are created with MVC style. And there's many, many other design patterns, but there's some big ones out there. MVC is the most important. And then you have what you find, just like with martial arts, martial arts will have favorite techniques. Like as a martial arts, I learned many, 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 many techniques, many, many different ways of, uh, of attacks and defense. But at the end of the day, I had a few things that I like to do. And you see that even with the champion fighters as well. They, they're trained in all kinds of different techniques, so they're aware of the possibilities. But you'll see in competition, when they actually fight, they may use one or two or three things over and over and over again with different setups. Same thing with programming. Programmers will learn all kinds of different design patterns, different approaches, but they will tend to focus on a few things that tends to work for them. And uh, I'm no exception. So MVC, of course, everybody uses MVC just about. And one of my favorite design patterns is filter design pattern. Uh, it, uh, some people call it decorators. Uh, a variant of that, I think, would be dependency injection. Again, this is high-level nerd stuff. So if you're going, oh, my God, what is this guy talking about? Don't worry. This is just a Sunday afternoon vlog, nerd discussion. So, you know, don't worry about it. This will come easy. This will come with time as you progress deeper and deeper. Uh, finally, I just want to end off with this because this is something, point number seven here, this is something that a lot of academic programmers don't recognize, and I call it the developer workflow. A developer workflow is, is literally that. It's a workflow, how your work flows and how you structure the software building process. And one thing that maybe developers don't recognize or don't emphasize enough is how your client figures into the workflow. So people will think about workflows, developer workflows, in terms of the code structure and, and the infrastructure around your code and how you're going to sort of, how you're going to deploy that, you know, using um, repos and all this kind of stuff and development cycles. But one thing that has to be considered that's not recognized enough is how the type of client you're dealing with, whether it be a small business client, whether it be another department in a large organization, whether it be a large client, how your interactions with the client will have an impact in your workflow. Because ultimately, in real world programming, the client will be coming back at you with a change request, with feedback in terms of how the app or how the program runs. And this um, injection from your client, if you will, this participation of your client and how your client participates in the development process is going to have an impact in terms of how the code base rolls out. And you have to consider, you have to consider all that uh, for efficiency's sake. So when I'm working with my developer, my lead developers, well, my lead developer right now and uh, my support developers around them, I have to consider the long-term trajectory of my software. And uh, because I know both ends of the game, I'm a client and I understand the business model very well, and I also understand the development model, I uh, structure the developer workflow accordingly so that we don't waste our time, we don't uh, have work that's uh, overwritten, if you will, because of bad communication. And we don't overload also the developers with uh, too much information about what's coming forward. So one of the things I've talked about in previous vlogs is how important it is for small business owners to have at least some knowledge of uh, coding. Not necessarily not to become coders, but just so that they can understand the process a little bit better, so that they can better communicate with the developers saving time, saving money, saving headaches, and uh, that's important. At the end of the day, all this coding, all this programming, all it's there to do is to save time and to facilitate a certain process, right? Think about it. Facebook, as elaborate as it is, is just a way to communicate and to sell ads and to expose ads to people. YouTube, it's you know pretty elaborate app, but it's a basically a video-based social network. It's there, again, to share information. That's at the end of the day, that's all it does. That's pretty much it. So with the last point, I want you to, what I would suggest rather that you take away from it is that you have to consider your client interface, your, how you're dealing with your actual clients, people. I'm not talking about client software, I'm talking about actual people. 
how their interactions with the coders, with the developer team, or the single developer, how this impacts in terms of how you structure your app and how you proceed in terms of building your, your, uh, your software. This is, again, I'm going to close off here. This is very high level. Uh, I'm just jumping around here. I just wanted to give people an idea of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about core programming. And again, in my courses, I, I expose these things, but not all of these things. Some of these things uh, require a little bit more experience to get into. The job, again, of the teacher is to A, to simplify, and to B, to expose to the student what they need to know at the right time to establish that solid base that's foundation so that they can much more quickly move ahead to produce good production code at a professional level. I hope that makes sense. Ciao.